Okay. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. It's great to see some familiar faces from the other side of the world. And uh, it's an interesting time and it's lovely to still be able to attend talks, even if they're rather different. And also, uh, Olivier Dudas has tried, been trying to convince me for about five years to start um, using technology. And I finally had to, but I'm still a beginner. Uh, and so, as Anton said, there's notes in the chat. Uh, and we will see how this goes. So, I want to start in broad terms and just explain uh, a dream that I've had for some time. Um, and I'm very excited about what I'm talking about today because it's a realization of a kind of piece of this, of this dream. Um, I remember really trying to, to do this when I was a graduate student um, in Kleiborg. Okay, so I just want to constant, uh, contrast two very fundamental theorems in geometric representation theory. The first one is the Baylins and Bernstein localization theorem. So I hope you're all familiar with this, but this is the statement that global sections provides an equivalence between D modules on the flag variety associated to a complex semi-simple Lie algebra and modules over the enveloping algebra with trivial central character. And this is a theorem that uh, completely revolutionized uh, representation theory. And I just want to highlight three aspects of it. The first is that the relationship is very direct. I can just write this simple big gamma that says global sections. And this is the functor that gives the equivalence. The second thing is that it takes central character into account. So that's present on the right hand side in the fact that I have to uh, divide out by the uh, ideal of things in the center which act trivially on, um, on, which act by zero on the trivial module. And also I can kind of, I can do this block by block by working with certain um, twisted differential operators. And the motivation, at least one of the motivations for this theorem was the Kajdan-Lutzik conjecture. And it may, once you have this theorem, the Kajdan-Lutzik conjecture is, is kind of manifestly present in D modules. And so there's still another step to do, which is to calculate um, stalks of simple D modules or simple perverse sheaves. But it's very clear what you have to do in order to prove the Kajdan-Lutzik conjecture once you have this equivalence. And just to, I, I was told that this should be a very um, elementary talk. Um, and I just want to emphasize that this is even remarkable for P1. So as an algebraist, we might take the enveloping algebra of SL2 and mod out by the ideal generated, two-sided ideal generated by the um, Casimir element. And we might hope to write down a classification of modules over this algebra. And people indeed did try to do this in the um, 50s and 60s. But once you have Bainance and Bernstein localization, you realize that, for example, if I take P1, remove 77 points from it, and put some crazy local system on the complement, that somehow <laughs> is reflected by um, a module on the right hand side. And so it not only answers questions, but it also tells, some, tells you that some questions are, are just not reasonable. So it's very, very powerful. And what I want to contrast that with is the uh, geometric Satake equivalence. So this is another fundamental statement um, in geometric representation theory. It's more recent. So the version that I'll be using was proved by Merkovich and Bilon in, in the mid 2000s. So we take G over K, a split reductive group. So it's something determined by root data. 
and we consider the complex affine Grassmannian for the dual group. And then we have that representations of G as a tensor category is equivalent to a certain category of perverse sheaves on this complex affine Grassmannian. So there's some in variety. And the three points on the left, they kind of couldn't be more different on this side. So I just want to, um, so the, on the left hand side, the, the, the equivalence is realized by the functor of global sections. Here, the relationship is extremely indirect via a Tanaki formalism. So you don't end up providing a functor in either direction. You argue that the right hand side is a Tanaki category and hence is equivalent to representations of some group scheme. And then you work rather hard to identify what this group scheme is. The block you want decomposition. To switch the terms on the right hand side, then, or no? The perverse should be on the left. Or? Ah, yeah. If you want, it depends. Let's say that the middle is the axis of symmetry. Oh, I see. The middle of the slide. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Um, yeah. So the relationship is rather indirect. The block decomposition is opaque. And for around the same time as the Kajanlitz conjecture was made, there was another conjecture made on the characters of the simple representations of G, um, which is the Lustig character formula. And I think that when people started getting wind that uh, this, this statement was true in the early 2000s, people kind of dreamt that this might sort out Lustig's character formula and make clear what was going on, um, but it is reasonably opaque. So today I want to explain, um, so basically the dream is that our geometric understanding of rep G here should pass through the geometric Sataki equivalents, and that should be the fundamental localization theorem from which everything else follows. And uh, some evidence for this philosophy is given by the work of Bezrel Kavnikov and also Vincent Lafogue. So in the work of Bezrel Kavnikov, he establishes various deep equivalences and Bezrel Kavnikov and co-authors by the starting point is geometric Sitake and then he builds structures on top of geometric Sitake. And also in, um, in Lafogue's recent work on the Langlands program for, um, for function fields, geometric Sotake plays the kind of key role in moving from G to its, the dual group. So I want to say that there's some evidence for this dream. And now today, I want to explain a proof um, on the side of geometric Sotake of the block decomposition and of the listed character formula for large P. And the technique, uh, I think, should be very powerful for other questions in modular representation theory. So I should say that this whole talk is essentially only interesting when K is of a uh, positive characteristic. OK, so that's the dream. Um, and now I'll move it on to some details. So the fundamental technique that um, we use, so it's a mix of two, two new things. One is called uh, Truman Smith theory. And the other thing is the Iwahori Whitika model for the um, geomet for geometric Satake. And I'll explain. So I'll first explain um, what Truman Smith theory is. And it's a very, elementary thing and very beautiful. Okay, so the principle of equivariant localization is we have a group action on X and we would like to relate kind of stuff on X to stuff on the fixed points. And stuff might be, for example, integrals, Euler characteristics, 
uh, cohomology. K theory. And the archetypal example of, uh, of equivariant localization is the fact that if I have an S1 action on a manifold, on a compact manifold, then the Euler characteristic of X is the same thing as the Euler characteristic of the fixed points. So this is an example where localization provides us with an exact formula. Um, often localization will tell us that, for example, something differs by something else up to torsion or something like that. So this is an example where we get an exact relationship. And this is kind of um, because the Euler characteristic of any non-trivial orbit is zero. Okay. So you can think about uh, X as being the fixed points plus a whole lot of non-trivial orbits, but all the non-trivial orbits are, um, are contributing zero to Euler characteristic because any non-trivial orbit is isomorphic to S1, not as an S1 space, but. And now the, the uh, more relevant example for us will be the example of a Z mod PZ action on a compact manifold or on a simplicial complex. And here we have the same statement that the Euler characteristic is equal to the Euler characteristic of the fixed points, but now it's only mod P. And why is that? That's because the Euler characteristic of any non-trivial orbit So Z mod PZ has precisely two orbits, fixed points or, or, um, or Z mod PZ. And so this Euler characteristic is P. And roughly speaking, this whole talk is motivated by the idea that Z mod PZ is a discrete circle. At least for mod p cohomology. And uh, uh, we can interpret two homologically. in that I can consider um, chains on the fixed points so FP chains and this embeds inside chains on everything Here, I guess I'm thinking about um, X as being a kind of simplicial complex. And Z mod PZ is you know, mo moving around my sim simplices. And the quotient is. Um, is a perfect is it's a perfect complex so. and this is even um, a complex of free modules and so um, the kind of key point is that this map here becomes an isomorphism in, I can consider the 
homotopy category of um, FP gamma modules modulo the um, perfect complex. Uh, what's gamma? Oh, gamma is... oh, sorry, gamma is. I said mod P there. Okay. So this is what um, Algebraeus would call the stable category. And the, um, the Grothendieck group of the stable category is Z mod PZ, and the isomorphism is given via Euler characteristic. And so this is this fact that these two complexes become isomorphic in the stable category is basically a categorification of this statement. And this is basically what um, Truman Smith theory is about. So we want to sheafify this observation that we've just made. And so now I want to switch from now on, X is a complex algebraic variety. And I have an action of Z mod PZ on it. And I can consider, so gamma is always Z mod PZ and I consider the bounded derived category of gamma equivariant FP sheaves. So sheaves of FP vector spaces. And now I have two restriction functors. I shriek and I star to the fixed points. I have two ways of going to the fixed points. Eh? And now uh, because the gamma action here is trivial, so This is just the same thing as the derived category of sheaves of FP gamma modules. Oops. And so I can do a kind of relative version of the thing that I did before. I can define the um, Smith category to be this thing. Modulo um, perfect complexes. And this is the kind of one of the key definitions. So by perfect complex, I mean um, a complex whose stalks are perfect. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a, a stupid question? How do you of think course. about FP gamma? What do you think about it? Like polynomials or? I probably, I, I think about it in a schizophrenic way as being either the group algebra of gamma or as a truncated polynomial ring. Mm -hmm. Either is okay, so FP X mod X to the P. Say uh, again. Can you write the description in terms of truncated polynomial ring? Just sure. But x to the p is one, right? Yes, but x is not the generator of the group algebra. Right. Okay. So x inside here corresponds to one minus g inside here. And one minus g to the p is one minus g to the p is zero. Great. Can you also say more precisely what you mean by perfect complexes? Um, yeah, so these are, um, so sheaves whose stalks, stalks are perfect. So stalks on the I, I can, 
I'm just, I'm using this. So I, I take a sheaf inside here and I look at its um, stalk at some point. Now this is a complex of um, gamma equivariant sheaves on a point, which is the same thing as a complex of FP gamma modules. And I ask myself, is this perfect or not? But in principle, you might require some stronger condition. You might require that it's actually a complex of sort of three things. I mean, that I mean that you take some non-equivariant sheaf and then just tensor it with a group algebra of gamma. Is, uh, mm -hmm. And let's say the things which are generated by such things. So, so that, that 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 seems like a stronger condition of what you're saying. Yeah, I think it won't be in this case. You will get the same thing. Okay. Uh, it's a very funny experience doing these seminars and then some voice that you know pops out of nowhere. <laughs> uh, switch the video. I can switch the video on if you want. <laughs> I'm a big fan of video on. It's, it's so helpful to see people's faces. So in general, if you want to put your video on, that's great. We can also ask everyone to introduce themselves, <laughs> but maybe it will take too much time. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a long list. Uh, okay, so, and the key lemma of, of Truman is that the cone, so we have a natural morphism from I shriek to I star, and the key lemma is that the cone of this is perfect. So the way to think about this, I believe, is that the difference between this is the cohomology of a sheaf, which is supported on the complement of the fixed points. And any such sheaf can be represented by a complex of free modules, a bounded complex of free modules. And so what that tells us is that we can, if we go to the Smith quotient here, So here we have the quotient functor. Now we get a new functor, which we denote I shriek star, which is called Smith restriction. And somehow if you've worked with uh, constructible and perverse sheaves, you know that somehow having these two functors is a real pain in the neck. And whenever you have one, um, life gets a lot easier. Uh, so I've, another example of this is hyperbolic localization. That's a really um, powerful functor in the presence of a T action. And this is some, I guess, we like to think about it as some analog of hyperbolic localization. And the meta theorem of Truman is that um, I shriek star commutes with everything. And what that theorem means is that at some point in your proof, you need to know that it commutes with something. And then you go and look at David's paper and you find that it does. Uh, so, and I just want to, so why are we calling this um, Truman Smith theory? So the origin of this idea goes back to work, work of P.A. Smith in the 1930s. And he proved a theorem, for example, that if you take the Z mod PZ fixed points on a homology P sphere, then it remains a homology P sphere. And this has as consequence that Z mod PZ fixed points on varieties that FP coefficients think are smooth. So these would, people would call FP Poincare duality spaces or FP smooth spaces. Taking ZP, ZP fixed points on such spaces um, preserves the property of being FP smooth. And you can do examples to see that this is really special for a Z mod PZ action with FP coefficients. Um, and why does this follow from the meta theorem before? 
in order to know that something is FP smooth, you would like to know that it's constant sheaf is self dual up to shift. And so you would like to know this on the fixed point set, but um, the, the constant sheaf is I upper star of the constant sheaf on the whole space. And so it's enough to check that it's self, that it's self dual up to shift on the whole space. Um, and I want to highlight the following um, useful, it, well, for us, extremely useful variant of this, which is a kind of equivariant um, Smith category. So we define it to be, so we assume that our discrete circle actually extends to the action of a real circle. So from now on, I will replace Z mod PZ with the pth roots of unity, mu P. And we, we uh, assume that the mu P action extends to an action of C star. So that's a really crucial uh, assumption to make everything work. And then we define the equivariant Smith category to be the equivariant derived category I mean, I could make this definition on any space on which the um, C star action is trivial. Oh, sorry, the mu p action is trivial. And so those are those complexes whose restriction to mu p inside C star is perfect. In the above sense. And so this called equivariant Smith quotient. And the basic properties is, as before, we have a Smith restriction functor. And so if we're on a point, a typical example of such a complex would be the complex representing the C star equivariant cohomology of C star with the not like C star acting on C star in the normal way. If you take the complex that computes that, then, um, then that complex, when you restrict it to mu P, it's a perfect complex. And what you can do is use that complex to, to show that um, there's basically an X2 from the constant sheaf to itself, um, whose cone is that complex. And you can use that complex to show that um, two is isomorphic to the identity on this quotient. So it's two periodic. Uh, and I just want to do the example of a point because it's very illustrative of what happens. So we can consider dBc star of a point with fp coefficients. And then we go down to the Smith quotient. And this can, this category can be equipped, can be, um, described in terms of um, DG modules over the equivariant, over the classifying space. So this is DG de, so that over of FPX. And so we can ask, is there a DG, um, DG modules description of the Smith quotient and indeed there is, it's just what we get by localizing our variable. All 
Okay, and I think it's very useful to think about this um, Smith quotient as being some kind of localization. I mean, yeah, it is a localization. Um, and I just want to highlight this. So on a point um, from this DG module description, this is um, clear that there's Homs from the constant, there's like X to M from the constant chief to itself is zero in odd degree and, um, and non-zero zero in even degree. Um, so because of the periodicity, it has to be some value for even and some value for odd. And I'm telling you that these are the values that it is. But um, the reason that we're so interested in this variant is that parity sheaves, sheaves now make sense. If we did this in the ordinary Smith quotient, we would get that hom in any degree from FP to FP is just FP. And that's problematic. Um, and it was uh, Leslie and Lonergan who first worked out a way around this and, and pointed out that, uh, that something like parity sheaves can make sense. What, what do you mean by parity sheaves make sense? Um, I mean, so, some of us have a theory that we know and love of parity sheaves in geome geometric representation theory. So we have some, for example, affine stratified variety, and we would like um, there to be a theory of parity sheaves and classification of indecomposable objects, etc. And for this, the, the theory is very soft, but all, what you need is um, basically some parity vanishing somewhere. Okay. And somehow this is enough. So I'm saying that in the settings in geometric representation theory where parity sheaves existed before, um, when we provide, when we do the Smith localization, parity sheaves still exist. So for example, on affine Grassmannians, on flag varieties, on et cetera. Can I ask a stupid question? So you said that the Smith category is too periodic, uh, but you're describing this in, in this example as um, DG models over some DG algebra. So it looks like it has a natural Z grading. Uh, mm -hmm. which is which, which it is not supposed to it's, a, it's only supposed to have a two, like a Z mode 2 grading or uh, Z grading and uh, you're describing and, and your description sort of provides it for the canonical Z grading which seems odd to me I mean I don't think that it's illegal for things that are too periodic to have a Z grading no it's not illegal um, but it's, it's, it's an additional structure so to say I mean, like this DG dirt, th th um, this thing down here um, is just equivalent to um, Z mod 2 Z graded vector spaces. Like, I claim this is a fancy uh, way. Uh, I'm sure you're right. I just don't see it on this board for some reason, but it's okay. Oh. This is what kind of homotopy theorists think of as being a field. And so this is like DG modules over a field. And so it's uh, anyway, yeah, anyway, you can think about why this is why this is just Z mod two Z graded vector spaces. You're asking about this diagram, how it interacts with the forgetful functor? Uh, I am saying that this the between the category of 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 digital over the over the over the and to uh, 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 period complexes. It does not 
That's correct, yeah. Yeah, you can think about this as being two periodic complexes, yes. Okay, so now I change um, direction a little um, and review some things about algebraic representations. So I'm hoping this is a review for most of you. Uh, so I'm interested in the representation theory of a split reductive group. So I fix the normal, um, normal data and WF is the, is the kind of fun, is the file group. And because I have affine vial groups in a second, um, the F is meant to remind me that this is finite. And here's a picture for SP4. Uh, and we have the character lattice and do dominant weights. And the Chevalet theorem is the statement that the, um, the simple algebraic D the simple algebraic G modules up to isomorphism are equivalent, so are classified by dominant weight, and this classification sends lambda to L lambda, and L lambda has, this has highest weight lambda. And just to remember that, so this looks like, uh, for example, representations of a compact Lie group, but in general, although we know a classification of these objects, um, their structure is much more complicated than, um, for example, for a compact Lie group. Um, so this is realized, for example, in the Sokol of some induced module for whom we know the character, but then the Lustig character formula that I was talking about before is concerned with expressing the character of, of these modules in terms of um, these induced modules. So here's our picture for SP4. So, whoops. So um, each of these dominant weights gives us a unique highest weight module and we call it L, L lambda. Now, a very important player in this talk is the linkage principle. So now we consider the affine vial group of the dual group, which is very important. So this is, the finite vial group semi-direct product, the root lattice. And inside this, we have a, a copy of W, an isomorphic copy that is, um, so it's a reflection subgroup and it's generated by translations in P times the um, root lattice. And absolutely fundamental is the dot action, which shifts the, um, so, so we just, we take the normal action of W and we shift it so that the center is minus rho, so that the, the um, point fixed by the finite vial group is, um, is minus rho. And the linkage principle is the statement that basically the orbits of um, this group here under the dot action give us something like a block decomposition of our category of representations. So rep. G is a direct sum over gamma in chi mod 
WP dot rep gamma G, where rep gamma of G is the SAIR subcategory generated by L lambda, where lambda is in the orbit of gamma and dominant. So I'll just, um, the next slide will be identical to this one, except I'll just give you a picture. Okay, so I haven't explained why, but this group, you can also see as being generated by reflections in these marked hyperplanes. Here you'll notice that there's a distance of, um, of five between the hyperplanes. And this, this example is the case of P equals five. So the reflections in these hyperplanes generate W5 in the dot action. And the block decomposition is given by looking at some, the orbit of some weight. So in this case, I look at the orbit of zero. I get infinitely many weights. And then I look at the SAIR subcategory generated by the simple modules of those highest weights. So another, another equivalent formulation of the linkage principle is that two simple modules do not extend unless they are in the same orbit of WP dot. Okay. So uh, I guess for some of for some of you this is very standard, and for others not so standard. So I'll leave that slide for another three seconds. I guess the the most important thing to remember here is the the presence of the affine vial group, the fact that we have the dot action, and also somehow, so th this was a conjecture in the 60s by, I guess, Verma initially, um, and then it was proved by Janssen and Anderson in the 70s. Uh, and somehow th there's a hint that Langland's duality is somehow at play here, even when you see this dual group appearing. Um, and also somehow, this linkage principle is kind of the step zero in our understanding, our algebraic understanding of the representations of G. It's very difficult to do anything without the linkage principle. Okay, so now I just want to briefly go over the affine Grassmannian. So to our group G, so this is a split reductive group over K of positive characteristic we can associate the Langlands dual group over C as a complex reductive group. And then we can consider the affine, um, affine Grassmannian. So this is a kind of, informally, it's an infinite dimensional projective variety in the same way that something like the direct limit of all projective spaces under the natural inclusions is an infinite dimensional um, algebraic variety. So it's an int projective end scheme. So it's a direct limit of projective varieties under closed embeddings. And you can also think about it, and this is very useful for understanding some aspects of the theory, as being um, polynomial loops into the maximal compact into a maximal compact. Let's say G check. So these are these are maps from S1 to um, the maximal compact that are obtained by restriction from an algebraic map from C star into G check. So just some examples to, I mean, it's impossible to get used to the affine Grassmannian in a few slides. Um, I got used to it by reading these amazing notes of Misha Finkelberg some years ago. Um, so the affine Grassmannian for G 
Jn is yeah, so uh, so I want to take Gm valued on Laurent series modulo Gm valued on power series, and this is isomorphic to Z by the valuation. And here I'm just, I'm not worrying about um, non-reduced structures, et cetera. So it's for the experts, but so you can think about this affine Grassmannian as just being Z. So this is not an algebraic variety, but it is a direct limit of, um, of projective algebraic varieties, namely a direct limit of finitely many points. The affine Grassmannian for SL2, um, I won't say in detail what it is, but it's, has a cell decomposition with one cell of every dimension off to infinity, but with uh, complicated gluing maps. So another space that has such a decomposition would be P infinity, um, but somehow this space looks very different to P infinity because the gluing maps are much more complicated. And when uh, G check is GLN, the affine Grassmannian is, can be realized as C T lattices inside C T to the Okay, so now, um, the geometric Sataki equivalence is this fundamental statement that the category, the tensor category of representations of G is equivalent as a tensor category to a certain category of, um, so this is um, certain constructible sheaves. On the on the affine Grassmannian, and just some remarks about this theorem. Um, the first thing to note is that only the coefficients change on the right hand side. So this space stays the same and somehow by varying this K, I can see the representation theory of G in different characteristics and over different rings, et cetera, which is kind of remarkable. So you can think about this vaguely in an analogy to the universal coefficient theorem in algebraic topology. Um, this is- This is algebraic representations. Or... Algebraic representations, yes, yeah. always. Mm -hmm. um, this is a cornerstone of um, geometric Langlands. So this category is the category of Hecker operators that acts at every point. Um, so this is a And important for us will be the fact that it um, doesn't extend to derived equivalences, d derived categories, not a derived. So rep G sits very naturally inside DB rep G. And this is certainly not equivalent unless I guess you're a Taurus or something, to, um, I, so Balinson in his beautiful paper on the derived category of um, perverse sheaves, he says that um, the niche where M dwells, the niche where the category of perverse sheaves dwells, 
um, is already known from the category of perverse sheaves itself, which I think is a very po poetic sentence. But in this case, this is not a case where the niche where this category lives is known by the category itself. But basically what we would like to do is understand the, uh, we would like to understand the linkage principle and various character formulas over here um, by doing something geometric over here. And so now we come to um, loop rotation. So the natural action of C star on Laurent series, just by moving the variable T, induces a loop rotation action on the affine Grassmannian. And this is very, this is also very naturally understood in terms of the, um, the model that I described of the affine Grassmannian as being polynomial loops into the maximal compact. Um, this, uh, and the fundamental observation, which I learned um, from Bezra Kavnikov at, in Boston in 2016. And I remember he told me this and I was really amazed and thought, oh, we, we have to be able to do something with this. Uh, is, oh, so one thing I should have set up here. I mean, so just for later use, this will be important, is that the simple module of highest weight lambda corresponds to so the orbits of this group on the affine Grassmannian are naturally um, classified by the same data that classifies simple modules for G. So what is this um, observation? It's about the mu P fixed points. So if we look at the fixed points under loop rotation, that's rather, they're rather boring. Um, in the language of polynomial loops, this is the homomorphisms from S1 into um, the maximal compact. And this was just a disjoint union of infinitely many finite flag varieties and finite partial flag varieties. But it turns out that if we take the fixed points under mu P, we get a much more interesting answer. And that's the following. This is a disjoint union over gamma in weight lattice modulo WP, but now there's no dot action. Okay. So um, I'll draw a picture in a second. Um, and moreover, each Gruer G check gamma is a partial affine flag variety. Does P have to be prime for that? No. No, and it works for every every tension. Right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so just some examples. So if we take the component corresponding to the zero to zero, then this is just G check T to the P mod G check e to the p, which various people call the thin affine grass money. And this is a kind of fascinating thin copy, so like self-similar copy of the affine grass money in itself, but it's very, very thin. 
another example is that if gamma is p regular, i.e. its stabilizer under um, under WP is trivial, then G check gamma is just isomorphic to G T to the P modulo and Iwohori. So this is a full affine flag variety. Sorry, here and told your definition of uh, gr gamma, right? No, but I can. Uh, so just with gamma is the is um, the G check T to the P orbit of T gamma. So given any element of the weight lattice, there is a corresponding fixed point in the affine Grassmannian. And if I just act on that fixed point by um, this group here, this, this gives me this component. I'm sorry, I'm, I am using some notation that I haven't introduced. Um, so just in this picture up here, if we imagine for a second that this point is zero, then it's precisely the points, the weights inside this region that index the fixed points, the, the components. And for example, here we have the thin Grassmannian, and here we have a whole lot of copies of the full affine flag variety. And then here we'll have various partial flag varieties. And the partiality is dictated by the stabilizer of this weight under the affine file group. So somehow, if we take fixed points under the full loop rotation, we get in some sense reasonably boring components. But if we take fixed points under this mu p, we get very interesting components that display a kind of recursive structure. So now, of course, this looks very suggestive. Um, here we have the linkage principle the blocks in inverted commas are determined by the, the dot orbits of WP. And over here in the mu p fixed points, the components are indexed by the non dot orbits of WP. So just to emphasize this, so there's, we're kind of almost at an explanation, except we're off by a row shift. And now um, we come to the second ingredient, which is this um, Basil Kavnikov, Merkovich, Gates, Gates, Gary, um, Risch, Ryder theorem, which is the statement that one has an abelian equivalence from the, so this is what people call the Sataki category. To the Iwahori Whitaker model. Or I don't know, the, there's surely a better name for this bit. So I won't go into detail about what this right hand side is. Uh, but it's extremely uh, beautiful. Um, so this is inspired by um, the Whittaker model. In rep theory, of p adic groups. Um, in order to define this, um, it's 
basically it says that a long orbit something should be look like an art and trial local system so it um, needs art and trial local system so hence we need to pass from c coefficients to fl bar coefficients for some l not equal to p uh, another beautiful aspect of this is that this equivalence, um, so this one doesn't extend to derived categories, this one does. So db rep g is equivalent to the full Iwahori-Whittaker derived category, okay? Um, and the most exciting thing from the, the, the perspective of this talk, there's many exciting things about this um, equivalence, but is that I C lambda over here goes to I C lambda plus rho over here. So on characters, um, this equivalence is a bit like multiplying by the vial denominator. So over here we have the vial character formula, but when we multiply by the vial denominator, things get remarkably simpler. Okay. And we incre in increase our highest weight to um, by a row. And so the um, and so that's the most important point for the moment. The components of mu p fixed points match precisely the linkage principle. Okay, namely when we expect when we expect two simples here, we expect two simples to extend precisely when their highest weights lie in the same component. So the main theorem um, with Simon is we have this, um, so recall from before we have Smith restriction. And inside here, it turns out, so the main theorem is that on an important subcategory, this induces an equivalence. So this um, subcategory so on a certain subcategory of parity sheaves, and these are precisely the things that um, correspond to tilting modules. Sorry, can you say in words what is on the left and what is on the right? Sure. The... Mm -hmm. So here we have the derived category underlying the Whittaker model of the Sataki category, except that we have an extra GM equivariance coming from loop rotation. This is and you need to be a tiny bit careful um, that that this Iwahori Whittaker condition and the loop rotation condition are compatible, but they are. So that's what the left hand side is. And on the right hand side, we have the Smith category. So the Iwahori Whittakerized version of the Smith category on the fixed point set under mu p. And inside here, we have Smith parity.
So I haven't said what parity sheaves are, but they are um, th they are sheaves whose restriction to um, restriction and co-restriction to strata only live in even degrees, for example. So this is an equivalence. Okay, and this may seem like a very technical statement, but it's it seems really remarkable. Um, so, so sorry, you're saying that um, taking parity sheaves commute somehow with lo this idea of localization, Smith localization. So this par Smith parity is defined directly at the uh, on the localized uh, fixed yes. point set. Yes. And then you say that uh, you obtain them by restricting through this uh, Smith localization parity sheaves on the total space. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's and not, probably not, the that's the, not the obvious. most well the the what that's what's kind of obvious is that there's a functor here. What is really remarkable is that this functor is an equivalence. So if you think about Normally what happens when you localize, you invert some parameters and things break up into many copies. But somehow this is the unique part of the universe where things don't break up when you localize. Okay. Um, and so an immediate corollary, so th this is a rather technical looking statement, but um, it uh, implies a number of statements that, um, it implies and immediately implies a number of very strong statements. And also I should say that the proof of this, once you have the technology in place is not difficult. Um, it's basically comes down to this kind of miracle of the fact that all the strata that are, that are involved here on the, um, on any comp component have the same parity of dimension. Um, Anyway, so I just want to, I'll just give two, um, I'll just give two consequences and then I'll stop. So the first one is that HOM between two tilting modules, T lambda, T mu is non-zero. So these are um, tilting modules of highest weights lambda and mu respectively. That implies that lambda plus rho and mu plus rho lie in the same component of quorum UP. And this implies immediately the linkage principle. And um, so this gives geometric proof of the linkage principle. And it also gives two ca character formulas. So it gives um, a proof of Lustig character formula for large P, um, and this is the first which passes through geometric satake. So it's kind of the first that satisfies this philosophy of um, using geometric satake as the fundamental localization theorem. And the second statement is a character formula for tilting modules. Um, so the remarkable thing about this is that it just works for all blocks and for all P, um, one has So this is a um, PKL polynomial. 
Uh, and so this was um, conjectured by Simon and I in 2016, and it was proved by um, Acha Makasumi, Rish and myself in 2019 for P bigger than or equal to h. But um, this proof is totally different and um, gives all p at once. Um, and just seems like it's a really new way to think about these things and um, should have other applications. So thank you very much for listening. question wait a second sorry i just i cannot okay please now can you unmute yourself and ask sasha uh yes uh so uh my question is the following so at least if you work not with the wahwari whitaker category but with the only category then uh you can uh, introduce this uh you know monitor on your longer term and bundle and you can get the abelian equivalence uh actually i think both abelian and derived equivalence with the with the quantum group for any q and so i wonder if your theorem uh, first of all can be extended to that case and second if it, if it can be extended to the case whether it can be whether it can give some interesting representation theoretic corollaries very good question and i did think about this to some extent um and we'll probably think about it more so but it's a, it's an extremely natural question. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, the first question is actually whether whether your proof for the Wahori Whitaker category so can be adjusted. I mean, for Q equal to one, so, so whether it can be adjusted to just one with a character that that I assume should be should be fine. But I don't know what your proof is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's kind of fascinating to to in, in this on this determinant line bundle to understand what the analogy. So it should be something like you know if your monodromy is non-trivially around the yeah. Um, I mean, it should come down to the fact that if you have a local system on S one with non-trivial monodromy, one-dimensional, then it has no cohomology. Um, but I haven't quite been able to understand how to make this work. No, but it's in, the most interesting thing is, is, is to do the roots of unity, of course. And for instance, yes, but that's that. So the roots of unity will kind of say that at certain points the monodromy becomes one. The monodromy goes away. Yeah. So, so for example, uh, we've been for example to reprove the Anderson, Janssen, Zorgel uh, equivalence in this geometric way. Yes. Somehow. Yeah. So I've gotten extremely excited about this about five times in the last three months, but um, still, still there's a uh, missing pieces. Sasha, but I don't I see how you how you want to relate. Uh, uh, so usual we take our model with the Sivakhori we take her. Well, if you don't have monogram, I mean, that they are the same. That's kind of well known fact, and well known and essentially obvious fact. I mean. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know about mod peak coefficients, I don't know, but if you can see the characteristic zero coefficients, they're always like that. Olivier, did you have a question? Uh, did I have a question? So, uh, this uh, observation by Bezo Kamnikov about fixed point set for this uh, thin affine cross manion, uh, is there an analog to the thick affine cross manion? <laughs> I don't know. Good question. Uh, I think the answer is double affine cross manion, so I think that it, 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 it appears. Wait, wait, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't hear. Uh, 
I'm saying that I think the answer is yes, and I think it even appears in one of our papers with Misha Finkelberg about this double of Eingras Manya. Pursuing the double of Eingras Manya. Yes, I think, I mean, Misha is here, so he can either confirm or deny this. I don't remember. But uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's written there, but, 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 I, but, I, but I think it's, it's essentially the same. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's absolutely the same argument, so there's no difference. Okay. More questions? So can, can you say how you prove the, can you say a little bit how you get this uh, uh, proof of Lustig character formula? If it's not uh, too complicated. Um, so probably I can say one thing. So I'm going to steal this. So now, um, so I was trying to emphasize before that here the kind of remarkable thing is that um, things, basically what's going on here is that um, all the homs here are in degree zero. And so when we invert a parameter, um, nothing happens. If we invert a parameter of degree two, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. But somehow that um, the things stay in decomposable across this arrow are rather, is rather um, remarkable. But um, what is kind of very easy is if we take parity sheaves uh, up on some um, affine flag variety, Then we we have the quotient functor that de defines um, the Smith category. This is the um, Smith quotient. And this preserves in decomposables. And so you can think about this as being a little bit like um, like this thing here is really controlling a block of your representations. Okay. And so now, um, you, if you want to answer combinatorial questions, you have to understand, um, for example, um, how certain a certain, a certain number of parity sheaves behave up here. But because now this is in the block, we can control this for large P for a finite number of strata, which control the six conjecture. So somehow getting a geometric realization of, the, of a single block in a direct way is what makes everything work. Hmm, I see. And so what did you say was the main geometric argument for this? map to be an isomorphism on parity sheaves? You said it's not so easy to, not so difficult to prove, but I, I don't remember exactly what you said. Yeah, so uh, there's kind of a whole lot of things that, that combine here, but basically the, the key point is that, um, that all, all homomorphisms here are in degree zero. Um, sorry, sorry. Um, You said something about even dimension of the strata or something like this. Yeah, essentially, yeah. So all of all of the strata that contribute to, to this category have the same parity of dimension. Over okay. here. This is the, the key geometric point, I would say. 
Okay. Thanks. So may I ask, is this vertical map you're writing, is it related to the Frobenius pullback or representations? Uh, so that's an extremely good question from an unknown voice that I assume is Peng. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not very presentable. <laughs> <laughs> prefer not to open the video. <laughs> um, so what, what happens for the, for the thin version? Parody, Iwahori, GM, on. So this is also this is also controlling something like a block. Mm -hmm. And now, but you know this is equivalent. This is just another another incarnation of the Alpha and Grassmannian. So this is equivalent to rep G. Mm -hmm. And so if you go across here you get some interesting equivalence of rep G with itself. Is that, sorry, like this is fully Contact. faithful inside it. Mm -hmm. And then the conjecture is that, um, I guess we don't know how to show this. Phi is magic functor. I.e. phi is equivalent to the functor of Frobenius pullback at tensor with Steinberg. So that's this really beautiful functor that um, seems like a miracle. And yeah, but I don't know if, yeah, I don't think we can show this at the moment. Okay, thanks. Where are you, Peng, at the moment? I'm in Beijing at uh -huh. home. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so, uh, who, are, who are the organizers of the seminar? Is it Anton and Olivier? Stop recording. Press play, stop recording. Ah. <laughs>